Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, as always, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and I'm really glad you're here with me today for episode number 311. Today will be a solo episode, and I'm going to talk about the conundrum of hope at the end of life. Before we get to that, I just want to thank my supporter on Patreon, John Kuntz, for increasing your monthly pledge. I really appreciate that. And thank you as well to all of my supporters who've been making monthly contributions for several years now to help keep the podcast on the air. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to my page at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U. And you can find out how to sign up and receive some of the bonuses that are available for patrons. So we'll move on now to my content for the for today on hope. And I've been wanting to talk about hope for quite a while now, but I was really spurred on recently by the interview I did with Dr. Joseph Stern, Jody, which aired in episode number 309. And Dr. Stern talked very openly about being at the bedside of his sister as she was dying of leukemia. And one of the things he thought about is the fact that she had so much hope in treatment and so much focus on treatment for her illness that she really never faced the fact that she was actually terminal and that the treatments she was receiving had very, very little chance of actually helping her. And also, her doctors did not want to confront her with the fact that she was most likely to die and that there was almost zero chance that the treatments would prolong her life or provide a cure for her. So he felt some regret that she hadn't had an opportunity to have quality time with her family of really talking about dying and what that meant to her, of telling them what her wishes were, and even perhaps leaving behind some letters for her children that they might read in the future. So Dr. Stern and I both discussed this concern about the fact that patients need to hear from their medical providers the truth sometimes and need to know what to expect at the end of life so that they can be better prepared. And this has been an issue I've had for years and years because throughout my time as a hospice doctor, I heard it over and over again, um, particularly from oncologists, that they didn't want to refer their patients for either palliative care or hospice because they felt it would take the patient's hope away. And that hope came from the patients believing that they could be cured, a miracle could happen, and that if they were to take the patient's hope away, the patient would die much more quickly in despair and hopelessness. And I tried to counteract that argument by talking to them about, first of all, what I had seen with hospice patients, that many times those patients who decided to forego treatment, who enrolled in hospice, actually ended up living longer than we expected them to, had a a better quality of life, and amazing, beautiful times with their family members that they wouldn't give up for anything. And so their family members had a better experience at the end of life as well, which was helpful for their grief process. And the pa- these patients ended up dying at home, dying peacefully in comfort and surrounded by love. And in contrast, I had seen many other patients who died in the hospital or in a treatment facility still receiving chemotherapy hours before they actually died and still enduring side effects and a great deal of suffering and sometimes not even being able to spend any time with their loved ones. 
So these are concerns I've had for a very long time that we talk about hope as if it has magical powers for patients and that we that we should never take away from them and this this is common throughout the medical profession and yet do we even understand what it is that we're offering to patients when we hand them hope and this discussion was further inspired by a blog post I recently read in the British Medical Journal written by Richard Smith and titled Hope is Hazardous. And he talks about a study from the Psycho-Oncology Journal, which involved patients' expectations of how long they were expected to live. Now, the interesting thing is all of these patients who were studied in the survey had been recommended by their doctors as patients who the doctors expected had less than one year to live. So all of these patients had terminal conditions and the doctors themselves realized it is not likely that anything is going to change the terminal course and they are not expected to live more than one year. But they did surveys with these very patients, asking them how long they thought they had left to live. And in the outcome of this this survey, 93% of the patients ended up dying far sooner than they predicted. And here are the results. The patients in the study, on average, expected to have eight more years of life. But in actuality, those patients had less than nine months left to live, which is what their doctors had predicted before they chose the patients to be part of the study. So there's a huge gap here in what these patients expected or understood as their prognosis and what the doctors already knew to be true. So um, Richard Smith was making the point, are these doctors handing their patients hope that isn't even realistic at all. And he talked about the fact that these patients were suffering from an optimism bias and also a couple of other biases he mentioned, the illusion of superiority and another bias about their degree of education and information about their illness. All of these biases, he said, have been fed by levels of hope because when they studied, they did an inventory of the levels of hope for patients. They found all of the patients with unrealistic predictions of their life expectancy also scored very high on the scale of hope. He mentioned that the doctors as well are suffering from the same biases, the optimism bias, even though these doctors selected the patient because they didn't believe the patient would live longer than one year. So Richard Smith's conclusion is that hope is deceptive and also can be harmful. And he states that as a result of this unrealistic hope, patients continue treatment that have little hope of benefit. They experience side effects and increased suffering as a result of ongoing treatment. Uh, some of which lasts for the remaining days of their lives so that they don't actually have days that are free of this suffering and side effects. They have less time available to spend with families and also to just experience the joy of being alive. They tend to be delayed in accepting palliative care because uh, the same doctors that are encouraging them to keep hoping don't want to say, I think you need palliative care or hospice because, uh, once again, as I already mentioned, they don't want to take that hope away, even though it's a false hope. And also, uh, Richard Smith mentioned the expense of care at the end of life, and particularly when it's futile and has no hope and does not increase quality of life for the patients as just another factor that we need to look at. He makes the point that 
delusions of hope were not an issue 70 years ago because there were few life-prolonging treatments even available. So this is a relatively new phenomena that we're grappling with. And I say it's important that we take a look at this. We really do need to be realistic about hope. However, Studies have also shown that hope is an important factor, particularly for cancer patients, but for all patients facing potentially fatal illnesses in terms of maintaining their courage and their strength and their willingness to go through what they have to go through in order to treat the disease. And we do know that patients who experience hopelessness or depression are more likely to die sooner from their diseases. So these doctors do have a point. Uh, they don't want to push their patients to a point, a place of feeling hopeless or falling into depression or despair because that definitely diminishes their chances for a longer survival time. However, that is kind of a black and white world that either patients experience hopelessness and they'll die sooner or we give them false hope to hang on to, which might help them live longer. Um, I think there are places in between where we can help patients be realistic about the fact, for one thing, everyone dies and terminal illnesses in general tend to be terminal. There are some miraculous cures and remissions that happen, but they're rare and there's nothing wrong with hoping for a miracle and that something miraculous might happen, but it's also worthwhile to be prepared in case this isn't the time for that miracle to happen. The miracle cure isn't in store this time around. And we need to be realistic with patients that there are things to do to prepare for the end of life that are important and that can make a big difference for them. So this is this is where all of us who care about end of life care need to have the courage to be able to talk to patients and help educate them. Ideally, I would like to see this happen much earlier in in their lives before people have received a terminal diagnosis so that they can throughout their adulthood come to terms with the fact that they're mortal and begin to make preparations and think ahead about what that would involve. But there's a few more things I want to say. I want to talk a little bit more about hope because I read a website that was very interesting and I think this gives us a lot of information about the the doctors who encourage patients to hope. So this website, this is a, a page on the, let's see, Stanford Medicine website, Surviving Cancer. And uh, it's a whole article about hope, the philosophy of hope and why hope is important. They make a good point, as I said before, that hope does help patients have the strength and the courage to go through some difficult treatments and to even give those treatments a try, maybe to go through surgery or some other type of therapy or medication treatment. And uh, it does take courage and it does take strength to withstand the treatments that sometimes patients have to go through. So... Um, that makes sense. I understand that. But in this article, the authors compare hope with Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And the fact Viktor Frankl makes a point in his book that the, the prisoners in the concentration camp who survived uh, the Holocaust were all people who found some sort of meaning within the suffering and the authors of this article equate hope with finding meaning in life when I have to disagree with that because I think there's meaning within suffering, not just meaning within hope. And I think they've made a slight error here in not recognizing that patients can come to terms with the reality of being mortal and the reality that one day they will die. 
and still find tremendous meaning in everything that's going on and and may still choose to go through treatment and choose to try a treatment that even has a small likelihood of being curative. But it isn't hope that provides meaning. Meaning is something different and patients find meaning and they may derive hope from the meaning that they have in life, but hope and meaning are not the same thing. That's one issue that I had with this particular article. And I'll read you a quote from this web page, which says, for patients with cancer, the future is often unknown, and hope is what keeps them alive to endure treatments and social and personal adversities. Hope is supported by the positive attitudes of the medical team, but can also be very fragile. Anything that demoralizes a person can negate the feeling of hope, which can make a difference in accepting or denying the next set of treatments if failure occurs. So here, I think an obvious bias is revealed, a bias toward treatment and accepting additional treatments, and the idea that hope is what keeps patients saying yes to one treatment after another, even if those treatments have very little chance of helping them. That is why I have a huge concern. Hope is being used as a tool to convince patients to stay in treatment instead of as a tool to help patients understand what has meaning for their own lives and to help patients make the best possible decision for themselves when they understand realistically what the possibilities are for them. So I have big problems with this idea of medical professionals using hope as a strategy for convincing patients to stay in treatment longer. I think that is wrong. And I'm going to play a clip for you from Stephen Jenkinson. He's the author of Die Wise, and I interviewed him a number of years ago when I, for a death expo that I did. But Stephen, in his book, has a whole chapter on hope. And I just want to share with you what he had to say about hope. So let me play that clip for you. The, the worst aspects of hope are not what people are hoping for, but in fact what the obligation to be hopeful is doing to them. I mean, ask yourself this. You come to a dying person's bed, and what do you think they're supposed to be hopeful for? What, do you, what kind of hope project are you going to bind them to? Mm-hmm. You know, and and what's the alternative to being hopeful? Well, we all know what it is. Hopeless. That's not an alternative. That's the same thing. That's two sides of the same coin. Or as I said in Die Wise, that's like having two brands of cola in Walmart. You call that a choice? <laughs> that's not a choice at all. How about being free of hope? What would that look like? And the answer is, you know yourself to be dying, you proceed accordingly. I'm not going to prescribe exactly what that should look like. Nobody should, because that's dying people's job to learn what that would look like, to be knowingly dying. See, And some days it means looking out the window and screaming. Of course it does. Some days it means you can't speak a word. Of course it does. And some days it means you feel that sun on your face the way you've never felt it before because the days when you're going to be able to do so, you can count on two hands. I mean, it's all in there. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't mean good times. It means deep times. See, everything is deepened. If you let it, hope doesn't let you let it. Hope obliges you to be chronically future oriented, as you read in the die wise, future oriented. Mm-hmm. And in that way, it functions like a mortgage, right? It takes away your present and obliges you to a future, which if you do the right thing, you know, and it sounds a bit like heaven, doesn't it? If you do the right thing, you're going to have a good outcome. So hope is one of the great enemies of being able to be a dying person, knowing yourself as such. 
I love what Stephen says here, that uh, it's not about good times, but about deep times. And I think that's what, that's what we say about meaning. Um, meaning in life is deep, and hope may be more superficial than that. And he says that hope takes away our opportunity for the deep times and takes us away from the present by projecting us into the future constantly. In the act of hoping, we're constantly looking ahead and hoping for something that will be better than what we have right now, that something will change in the future instead of being in the present moment. And so I think that's very significant, and I agree with Stephen here that hope can be harmful and can be hazardous if we don't know how to use it. Hope is like a potent medicine, and if we apply too much of it in the wrong ways and thoughtlessly, it can be harmful to patients. And to add to this, I think it isn't just that medical professionals may offer unrealistic hope to patients, but patients themselves may cling to hope for various reasons. And I think there are some patients who have a deep, unaddressed fear of death, and hope may be one of the ways they avoid and repress that fear. And so they're clinging to their hope that something will save them, a miracle will happen, they will be cured, because they do not want to face their fear. Those patients already probably walk in the door with their own hope projects going on as um Stephen Jenkinson used that term, a hope project. They already have their own hope project. The doctor may have a hope project as well. And when they combine together, there are a lot of unrealistic expectations that get generated on both sides. Now, I have seen patients who have this hope and optimism about them that I believe derives from simply their love of life, not at all from fear. I even remember a 95-year-old man who was on our hospice service who just said to me, I love being alive. I love every moment of it, and I would take as much of it as I could get. I would take as many more days as I could possibly have in order to stay here longer because I love it. Now, this man was just just filled with joy and love, and there wasn't fear of dying. He just simply liked being here. He liked this life, even after 95 years of living and even after dealing with with significant illness and suffering, he still loved life. That's a type of optimism and hope that I think provides tremendous quality of life throughout one's days, but particularly at the end of life. And so there's something about that quality that that man possessed that Uh, no one would want to take away from him. And yet no one could. No one could. He remained optimistic and hopeful and loving every moment of his life, even though he also knew that his time was limited. And so he was making the most of every moment of his life in this hopeful way, which I think when we talk about hope, that's what we are aiming for. That's what we would like to see patients have. But the reality is for many patients, hope is a disguise that's hiding tremendous fear underneath. So it isn't this genuine love of life and joy in life. It is a painful terrifying process and the hope is superficial and just covering up the need to address the fear of death. So I have one more study that I looked at, which was an interesting study done with patients, their caregivers, and their physicians. They did focus groups with all of these groups and surveys with them and and talked to them a lot about nurturing hope at the end of life. So the study was, uh, was called Fostering Coping and Nurturing Hope When Discussing the Future with Terminally Ill Cancer Patients and Their Caregivers. 
And so it was interesting because they found that there were different perspectives uh, between patients and caregivers and doctors. Those groups had somewhat different perspectives. Patients uh, in general said they wanted to be told the truth. They appreciated it if the doctor would be truthful and that it actually helped them uh, feel calmer and even more hopeful if they knew the doctor was honest with them about what was happening. But the patient specified they wanted honesty, but not too much bluntness. So they wanted a gentle honesty um, and perhaps honesty delivered in a way over time that would not frighten them too much or shock them too much, but honesty that would gradually help them come to recognize what was happening for them. Doctors, on the other hand, seem to have a lot of concerns that patients may not want to know the truth and talked about patients they had worked with who didn't want to know their prognosis, did not want to hear any, quote, bad news, and didn't necessarily want them to be honest, which was very interesting. Um, doctors also had a lot of disagreements amongst themselves about whether or not to foster hope in miracle cures, whether or not to hold out hope that here's this treatment that, you know, one of my patients of the last 1000 was helped by, it might help you too. And so there was a, a lot of disagreement amongst doctors about whether or not to use hope in that way. Some felt that it was essential in or, and that their patients benefited from it. Others felt that it wasn't the best way to work with patients. The study concluded that, and the doctors agreed with this, that there's actually a spectrum of hope. And when they looked at it, at what they had witnessed in their own patients, they realized that for some patients, hope consists of simply wanting a miracle cure or to live longer. And for other patients, hope involved other aspects as well as uh, being able to stay alive for a certain event, recognizing that they were going to die, but wanting to live long enough to take part in a certain event, a family celebration of some, some sort. Others wanted hope that their symptoms would be controlled. Other patients wanted to find meaning in life and were hopeful that that would happen for them in their last days. Other patients viewed hope as wanting to be cared for and supported by a loved one. And then finally, the hope for a peaceful death. So this spectrum of hoping covers the people who were um, most desperate for a cure and to live longer were those people who tended to be more fearful of death. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, the people who were hoping just to have a peaceful death had already accepted the idea of mortality. This makes sense to me that hope isn't just one thing. There's a whole spectrum of how people hope and what they hope for and why they are experiencing experiencing hope in the way they are. And, you know, when we look at it, doctors as well are dealing with all their own fears and their own biases and their own past experiences, even unhealed grief. So when doctors and patients come together, it's an interesting mix of experiences. And it makes sense to me that some doctors will will utilize hope in a negative way and convince patients that they need more treatment and hold back honest and truthful, realistic information about the future. Most of them thinking that it's in the best interest of the patient, that this is what they need. Um, as that web page from Stanford said, that this is the right thing to keep instilling more and more hope in patients because that's what will give them the courage and strength they need to fight their illness. And so this brings up uh, another term related to hope, which is the idea of fighting for survival, the idea of illness as the enemy, death as the enemy, that patients need to fight. They need to have their courage and be strong so that they can fight the good fight as long as possible. I think this idea of, of fighting the good fight goes hand in hand with unrealistic hope. 
And I have another little clip to share with you from Stephen Jenkinson, who talked about this very thing as well, who, who talked about how could we look at it differently than this metaphor of fighting. So I'll play that clip for you right now. Do you use the word... Um rather than fighting mm. to not die, mm. uh, we should be wrestling with uh, our yeah. dying. And I really liked that. I really uh -huh. liked that imagery of wrestling with dying. So mm. not, not even, not just acquiescing to the dying either, no. but, but actually struggle with it, as you said, and let every day be different. Every day brings something new in this process of struggling through it. Mm. Yeah, the language of fight carries the prejudice that the only reason you fight is to end the fight. That's what fighting's for, to stop, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Nobody fights to keep fighting. That's not in the nature of fighting. The nature of fighting is to stop it, to get to the other side, to solve it, to win, or whatever it is. But wrestling, although it seems to have a kind of similarly violent or aggressive tone to it, maybe even a better word would be something closer to dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's even a better uh, characterization that... The purpose of dancing is not to get it over with, is it? Surely not. The purpose, well, purpose, the, the function of dancing is to dance. So you dance your death. You're not quite in charge, but neither is dying quite in charge. Sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow. Sometimes the symptoms are the only show in town, and many times they're not. And sometimes you need medical expertise, but dying's not principally medical. And the medical people should be let off the hook for being the three-ring circus masters of dying and relegated to, a, to a, a minor position of attending to the, to the, you know, the, the medical aspects of what is, a, what is a mystery play called human beings dying. So Stephen makes a couple of really good points here. On the one hand, that dying is not necessarily a medical experience or a medical emergency, and that the role that medical people play in dying should perhaps be diminished, and that we need to empower other people to be part of the dying process and to support people through dying, and leave medical people to treat only the medical issues that are present. But also, I really loved his metaphor of dancing with death and that sometimes you lead, sometimes death leads, and it's a little different every day. And we need to be in the moment so that we can experience whatever is happening in that moment and we can make the most of whatever is available to us at that time. And I really love that metaphor and to escape from this idea of fighting, which implies that there's a winner and a loser, that if you die, you will lose the fight as if you didn't, you didn't do what you could, all you could do. You didn't do a good enough job of fighting and the illness won. No, of understanding that death is a reality and a natural part of life. And again, we are dancing with death. Perhaps we're all dancing with death throughout our lives. Death is always our partner and always present. And when we view it that way, there isn't a winner and a loser. It's the natural evolution of life to move toward death. And I find that such an appealing and lovely image, the idea of dancing. And in that regard, hope goes along with the idea that we need to win the battle. We need to win this fight that we're making in order to live longer. We have to win the, win the fight and do our best and struggle with death as much as we can. But what if, in fact, we're just dancing with death and the hope is that we do the best dance possible on our way to death. The hope is that that we we make the most of it, we get the most joy from it, we find the most love within it that we possibly can. And so I wanted to draw a few conclusions here from all this information I'm sharing that I read about hope and to think about how do we help patients 
with hope. And the group that I'm the most concerned about are the patients who are relying on hope to help them cover up their fear of death. Because those are the patients that truly need some help. They're the patients most likely to make decisions to prolong futile treatments, um, receive aggressive care right up until the time of death. So if we have a chance to be involved with those patients, I, I think it's really helpful for us to learn to assess when there is a fear of death present. And those are patients who are going to be unwilling to talk about their own death, who might even say, don't tell me anything I don't, I don't want to know, patients who are reluctant to enroll in hospice or palliative care. So I think... It's important, if we're able to, to gently help people who have that fear of death to begin to look at it. And perhaps we can have conversations with them about life itself and what life means to them, what their goals for their, their life is, so that rather than talking about their death, we're asking them to look ahead at what, what they might desire for themselves, uh, regardless of how much time they have. But in that conversation, to also ask if they have had any past experiences with the death of a loved one and ask about some of the reasons why they might be fearful. Perhaps they've had been through a really traumatic death of a parent or a sibling or, or another loved one, and uh, we might be able to understand some of their fear if we hear about some of the experiences they've had in the past. I think that can be really helpful. Also find out if there's any unhealed grief that has never been addressed for that person, because sometimes grief masquerades itself as a fear of death as well. And so as you're talking about past experiences and current goals for life, um, be sure to ask what really matters to this person. Help them discuss what is most important to them in their life and help them look for the depth, the deeper issues of life, not just it matters um, that I have my house repainted or matters that I buy a new car or um, the more superficial aspects of life. Help them look more deeply and look at relationships and meaning and love and uh, what they feel their life has been about and, again, what they would like to accomplish in the future what right now feels undone for them. And from that point, it's possible to move into eventually, like this might take place over a series of conversations, to move into the idea of treatment options that are available and to talk about in light of what really matters and in light of these other goals for life, how do various treatment options affect those goals? And to begin to look realistically at the treatments themselves that are available. And um, I'm not saying this is going to work with everyone. And some of the doctors in the survey and the focus group that I mentioned said, at some point, we have to let people feel what they feel and believe what they believe. And we can't take it away from them if they are clinging to hope. And it's true, we don't want to rip someone's hope away. And we don't want to shock them with a message that would would push them into terror or fear. We want to be gentle and compassionate. And ultimately, it's a unique experience for every person. Hope, in a way, is it's so nuanced. And it depends so much on what life has shown us and taught us so far and what we've come to believe and to understand about ourselves. So again, regardless of what our biases are or how we view the end of life and how things should be, we can't really push the patient where we would like to see them go. We simply need to go on the journey with them and support them and be there with them. Finding little opportunities here and there to talk about what really matters, to talk about 
love and joy and meaning and finding peace in life, making peace with the past and uh, making amends in life and tying up loose ends whenever we can and as much as possible. But again, with, with gentleness and love and compassion so that we're not pushing people, but we're simply creating a safe container for them where they may have the opportunity to, to go within and examine their own fears. And maybe we can help them make a little bit of progress there. And once there's less fear of death, then I think a more realistic version of hope becomes possible. And so that we can help people be optimistic and find a love for life and love and joy in the present moment so that they can stop fighting against death and learn to dance with death live in this moment and stop looking to the future as the source of meaning for their lives, but find the depth and the meaning right here and right now in the present moment. So remember that hope is a powerful tool. I wouldn't say that hope should never be used, uh, like uh, Richard Smith, who feels that hope is hazardous and damaging to people. But I wouldn't say that hope is always the right strategy for every patient either. I think we, we need to be realistic, we need to be honest, we need to be open, and we need to create safety for other people. And there is a place for optimism and believing in the goodness of life and the goodness of the world and loving life just as it is right here, right now in the present moment. And I think that's what we should be fostering and help people move a little bit more toward that acceptance, the dance with death in the present moment, wherever we are, and making the most of life as it is, which brings me to the tagline that I always use for this show, which is that we're here for love. So of all the things we can talk about and teach people and help them with, love is the most important thing. So if there isn't time to talk about anything else, if we can bring love into someone's life, we will have made a difference. That's number one, the most important thing we can do for them and for ourselves. So be sure to face your fear, your own fear, whatever that might be. Be ready for what life brings you next. And just love each and every moment that you are given of this precious life. Bye-bye.